into a Ferrari called the E-Type Jag, the most beautiful car ever made. To me, it's as English as fish and chips, warm beer, and a good cup of tea. It's a fashion statement that never went out of style, and that's why the E-Type Jag is the big thing. These are the poster cars on your wall. Now, let's take a closer look at them. Go for a drive. Find out what makes them so special and why they are the big thing. I like to get up early and start the day with a drive. For me, Driving is a form of meditation. When the roads are quiet, I can let my mind wander and feel connected to the car in a way that you can't. Once the sun's up, the people are out and the roads are packed. This morning's drive to Griffith Park is special because I'm in a car that never fails to bring with it a sense of occasion, a Series 1 E-Type Jag. And not just any E-Type, but the much coveted Series 1 in Carmine Red. This is a 23,613 mile car, all original, unrestored. Those of you who know your Jags know that that's rarer than a five-legged pussycat. This isn't the first time a geezer in a bowler has hustled an E-Type around these Hollywood hills, but more on that later. Having owned three E-Types and currently owning two, I will say, the second I got behind the wheel of this 1965 4.2 fifth coupe, which is on the license plate, the California black plate, I knew straight away it was something special. Unrestored. I've never driven an unrestored E-Type, but it shifts great. Everything's tight. There's still body roll and stuff, because you've got to remember, the car's 60 years old. Visibility is good, but it takes a little time to get used to the long front bonnet, which seems to go on forever. I've always been a fan of the E-Type. Along with the 911, it's a car that's been on my mind and in my heart since I was a kid. I know the figures by heart, 265 horsepower and 254 foot-pound of torque from a bored out 4.2 version of Jag's famous inline six, an engine with racing pedigree, including three straight 24-hour Le Mans victories in the D-Type from 55 to 57. But for me, it's usable performance. You know, once you figure out reliability of an E-Type, which really on an early car is all based around cooling. You know, these cars were designed in England, of course, even though, you know, the vast majority of them were imported and without a shadow of a doubt, America was, you know, the global marketplace for E-Types and all of the sports cars for that matter. And nowhere in America embraced the E-Type more than LA. Through the 60s and 70s, there was no greater way to show that you're a cool, hip, rock and roll guy or girl than rolling around Hollywood and the Sunset Strip in an E-Type Jag, which is why I'm here, naturally. With over 4,200 acres of landscape, Griffith Park is one of the country's largest urban parks. Opened in 1896 and home to the LA Zoo, Gene Autry Museum, the Hollywood Sign, and the Griffith Observatory. The observatory opened in 1935 and has been a popular destination for locals and tourists for many years, often featured in films, perhaps the most famous being James Dean's knife fight scene in Rebel Without a Cause. With free admission, the planetarium has always been a hit. 
Enough pretending to be a movie star. It's time to hit the road. Another great thing about Griffith Park is driving through this tunnel that I'm about to go through right now. You know the story. Sports car, revs in a tunnel. It's a little cheeky sometimes, I know, but we're all gonna do it. So here we go. First gear pull into second. Through the tunnel, blasting out into the parkland. Nothing beats this. The E-Type Jack started in late 1956. By early 57, the first prototype was on the road, powered by a 120 horsepower, 2.4 liter XK engine. Malcolm Sayer designed the E-Type under the direction of Jack boss Sir William Lyons. Lyons wanted Sayer to make a car that would serve as a road-going sports car, replacing the aging XK150. But in actuality, it was more of an evolution of the D-Type, which had won Le Mans three years in a row, from 1955 to 1957, rather than a replacement for the XK150. By July of 1959, the final airplane-inspired, sleek and sexy design had crystallized and was doing high-speed testing on public roads, like the M1 in England reaching speeds of up to 150 miles an hour. Such dangerous high-speed feats would never pass an automotive boardroom or legal department today. It has too much speed for the public roads, but it does make for a whale of a touring car. The E-Type debuted March 15, 1961 at the Geneva Auto Show. The story of how the car got there is less well known and way more exciting. As crazy as it is to believe by today's standards, Jack test driver Norman Dewis drove the first production Roadster, E-Type number 77RW, 733 miles, straight from Jack's factory in Coventry, England, to the car show in Geneva, Switzerland. He made the journey driving throughout the night via Brussels in order to make the 10 a.m. press conference and did it in just over 11 hours. It must be said, Jack boss William Lyons was a bit of a marketing genius. The attention-grabbing 150 mile an hour headline made the Jag a smash hit from the beginning. But in reality, the car that hit that speed, car number 9600 HP, was a highly developed and race tuned lightweight car running on taller tires which allowed it to achieve a higher speed than the actual production cars. This all played into William Lyon's marketing script of debuting the car in a ritzy location, the Geneva Auto Show, where he knew Europe's jet set would be sure to see his latest creation. His plan worked. Jack had planned to sell 250 cars at the show, but by the time the show ended, pre-orders topped 500. And perhaps the only thing that separates it from its contemporaries such as the Ferraris of that era and Aston Martins of that era, is that the E-Type was built in large numbers, really large numbers. To be precise, 72,520 of them were built, which made them obtainable. But it also probably kept the values down because it wasn't a limited production car. The E-Type Jag was split into three different series and was in production from 61 through 1974. The original car had a 3.8 liter motor and the four-speed non-synchronized MOS gearbox. In 1964, that was upgraded to the 4.2 liter motor and the four-speed synchro box. In late 66, we got the 2 plus 2 automatic and the unofficial series one and a half 
interim car before Series 2 came out in 68 and continued in production through 71. In 71 we saw the debut of the V12 E-Type that was in production all the way through 1974 with a few significant body changes such as flared fenders and a larger wheel opening. The 2 Plus 2 debuted in 1966. On the positive side it was 9 inches longer, had two small rear seats and more leg room. Stylistically though the taller windshield, bulbous roof line and longer doors were not as attractive to look at. Ironically though, 1966 was E-Type's best sales year with 6,880 cars sold with the 2 Plus 2 being the most popular model. So go figure. Today the 2 Plus 2 represents great entry level affordability and value into E-Type ownership. But buyer beware of reliability issues. I recently bought two myself of the most unloved examples, the 2 Plus 2 Automatic, and both of my E-Types have left me stranded on the side of the road multiple times. The white one is a Series 2, and the blue patina one is a Series 3 V12 that I bought for $16,000. I plan on converting it to a 5-speed manual with upgraded suspension, whilst keeping all that great patina. For the purists, the Series 1 is the car to have, and they're easily recognizable from other models with their glass-covered headlights. All rode on 15 by 5 inch wire wheels with knockoff center spinners, three blade wipers, and delicate chrome bumpers with turn signals above. Newer cars have the turn signals below. The louvered long bonnet and ample chrome trim complete the elegant yet sporty look. And on the inside, there's leather seats, plush carpet, an adjustable wood rim steering wheel, and ample rear luggage space. There's toggle switches, which later cars had rocker switches, and the push button ignition, well, it just adds to the drama of starting. And of course, the signature chrome twin exhaust pipes. This was a time when British culture was everywhere and the rest of the world wanted to look like us, dress like us, sound like us and drive like us. And because of that, the E-Type owners list reads like a who's who of the swinging 60s. Celebrity owners such as Frank Sinatra, George Harrison, Peter Sellers, Twiggy and Britt Eklund gave the E-Type an extra cool factor. Mike Myers made the E-Type famous all over again in the Union Jack clad E-Type in the hit movie Austin Powers of the late 90s. Yeah, baby! <laughs> yeah. And right here in LA's cultural epicenter, the Sunset Strip, you see all sorts of cool and interesting influential people pulling up outside the various nightclubs, bars and restaurants in an E-Type. It was the ultimate statement of fashion and flair. And Sunset Strip was the scene of my own Englishman in LA type of rock and roll revolution when I landed here in the summer of 1986. It was my first real taste of freedom. Freedom to go wherever I wanted, dress however I wanted, and wear my hair however I wanted. So driving down here today past such icons of my youth as the Viper Room, Rainbow, Roxy and Whiskey and a Series 1 E-Type Jag sort of feels like a full circle moment both for the car and myself. I often say LA is the car culture capital of the world and on any given Sunday, you're as likely to run into a six-wheel Mercedes AMG as you are to see vintage bikes, muscle cars, and the current trend of dirt bike street takeover. So 
What's it like to drive in real-world situations? Well, the 4.2-liter inline-six motor is silky smooth. It's torquey and revs freely. The gears are tall and it shifts real nice. With disc brakes, it stops better than other cars of its era, but it does tend to understeer, float around at speed, and the front end dives under hard braking. And to me, it feels a little undertired and underwheeled. Visibility is good, but it takes a little time to get used to that long front bonnet, and it's somewhat cramped inside. The transmission tunnel and pedal box are prone to heat soak, no doubt due to the exhaust location right underneath the floorboards. So my Uncle Mick, Mick Edwards, back in the day, by that I mean the late 70s, early 80s. Mick Edwards had done pretty well. He was a market trader, sold pots and pans and pottery and paint, brush cleaner, all types of fun stuff that everyone had. So he did pretty well, managed to buy himself an E-Type Jag. And I do remember taking a spirited run up Ringing Low Road in that E-Type Jag. You could do 100 miles an hour on that road pretty easy. And it did have some work to do. But I'll save that story for another day as well. But today, I've enjoyed my drive around in the 65 Series 1 E-Type Jag. It's got just enough power to have fun. I'm on one of LA's sort of iconic roads, Mulholland Highway. People have been having fun racing around on this road since back in the 50s. You know, Jan and Dean even wrote a song about it. There's a section called Dead Man's Curve for all the obvious reasons. You know, back in the late 50s, early 60s, Steve McQueen was ripping around here in his Jag XKSS. You know, all the pro racers would come up here and race Mulholland. The Mulholland Road Racers Club, as it was come to be known. Cars aren't built in a vacuum. They're made at a specific moment in time and within a specific context. And the best cars, like the E-Type Jag, perfectly capture a specific cultural moment and communicate it beautifully and timelessly to future generations. It's a bit like poetry in motion. So why does the E-Type Jag matter? And why is it the big thing? Well, back in its day, it was the fastest you could go on four wheels. Sure, it had issues, the overheating and the electrical gremlins. But once you get behind the wheel, that stuff ceases to matter. And it showed an entire generation of kids, kids like me, that there was a whole world out there just begging to be explored, enjoyed and discovered. Malcolm Sayers design is still timeless. It's a piece of rolling art. This car has been in the Museum of Art in New York City and it's on permanent display at the Modern Museum of Art in London. And true to its ferocious namesake, it has clawed and leapt its way into car culture forever. And I have to say, Enzo Ferrari was right when he called the E-Type Jag the most beautiful car ever made.